The involvement of Soviet partisans in Russia's conflicts was not a new phenomenon by 1941. During Napoleon's 1812 invasion, small groups of civilians attacked the French forces and their allies before and after their retreat from Moscow. In World War I, German forces also had to divert troops from the front lines to manage partisan resistance in the occupied territories. Many partisan groups also emerged during the Russian Civil War. Red partisan units, especially in Siberia, played a crucial role by disrupting the supply lines of the White Army, contributing significantly to the communist effort in the Far East. One notable commander, Vasily Bluka, led the Ural's partisan army and was honoured with the Order of the Red Banner for his leadership. However, he later became a victim of Stalin's purges, dying from a brutal beating. Even after the Civil War, Soviet leaders continued studying the organisation and tactics of partisans. Lenin discussed the topic in some of his writings, and Marshal Mikhail Tukhachevsky produced several documents on partisan strategies, including methods to both implement and counter them. Tukhachevsky, like many others, was executed on Stalin's orders in 1937. By the summer of 1941, the concept of partisan warfare had become ingrained in the mindset of many Soviet citizens. For dedicated party members, civilian resistance to any enemy threat was unquestionable, driven by a strong sense of duty to the communist system, making the decision to fight instinctive. However, for many others, the decision to take up arms took more time. Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of the Soviet Union, launched on June 22, 1941. Although a few Russian commanders, risking their own safety, positioned their forces in forward defensive positions, most followed Stalin's orders not to provoke the Germans. Stalin had ignored multiple warnings of an impending attack, preferring to believe that the non-aggression pact with Hitler, signed in August 1939, would hold for at least another year. Stalin's refusal to act led to a catastrophe for the Red Army. In the first six months of Barbarossa, more than three million Soviet soldiers were killed or captured. In the Kiev region alone, over 600,000 were lost, while the defense of Smolensk cost the Red Army an additional 486,000 men. Around Uman, another 300,000 were captured. The sheer number of Soviet soldiers killed or captured overwhelmed the Germans, who were unprepared to handle such a large influx of prisoners. Despite the apparent success of the German encirclements, the lines surrounding the trapped Soviet armies were often not secure. Many remnants of divisions managed to slip through gaps in the German positions and escape eastward. Others, in smaller groups, or individually disappeared into the forests and marshes of western Russia. Even when trapped behind enemy lines, these men continued fighting, becoming the foundation of the early partisan units. While Moscow had anticipated that local party leaders would form partisan units in the event of an invasion, actual preparations such as stockpiling supplies and weapons were severely lacking. The rapid advance of the Wehrmacht through Western Russia further disrupted the formation of early partisan groups as German forces were upon them before many officials had time to react. Another challenge came from the local population in parts of Western Russia, especially in Ukraine and former Polish territories, where there was considerable resentment toward Moscow. In the early stages of the war, many locals viewed the Germans as liberators and were willing to identify communist officials. Despite these obstacles, efforts were made from the outset to establish a civilian-based partisan movement in some areas. Over a thousand party members were left behind in Belarusia, with others ordered to remain in various regions soon to be occupied by the Germans. Their primary roles were to organize communication networks, locate safe houses, and set up hidden weapons caches for future resistance efforts. By the end of June 1941, Moscow finally issued an official directive to rally the nation for resistance. On June 29th, the Central Committee of the Communist Party and the Council of People's Commissars released a proclamation urging local party organizations to form partisan detachments and take the fight directly to the enemy. This call for action laid the foundation for widespread civilian involvement in guerrilla warfare. In mid-July, a more detailed order followed, providing specific guidance on how the partisans should be organized and what key targets they should prioritize for sabotage. The structure of the partisan detachments was outlined with precision. Each unit was to consist of 75 to 150 men, divided into two or three companies, and those companies were further split into platoons. Strategic advice emphasized the importance of basing operations in large, forested, or swampy regions, where the terrain provided natural cover and protection from enemy forces. Detailed instructions were given on how to create and distribute weapons caches to ensure fighters were always well supplied. 
partisans were instructed to conduct night raids on crucial enemy infrastructure. Petroleum and ammunition depots, railroad lines, airfields and communication hubs were listed as priority targets for destruction. The partisans were not only taught how to disrupt these vital resources, but also where to place explosive charges for maximum impact. Additionally, the orders covered tactics for various combat situations, offering strategies for launching attacks, defending positions and evading enemy pursuit. These guidelines aimed to empower the partisans with the skills to be both effective and elusive, ensuring they could continue to disrupt the German war effort despite overwhelming odds. Once the Communist Party became fully involved in the partisan movement, the vast Soviet bureaucracy sprang into action. Committees were established at every level of government, from the national to the local, to oversee and coordinate guerrilla activities. Powerful figures within the party, the NKVD, secret police and the Red Army began competing for control over the partisan operations. Ultimately, the responsibility for overseeing partisan warfare was handed to Lev Meklis, a notorious political leader who headed the main administration of political propaganda for both the army and the NKVD. Meklis had gained a fearsome reputation during Stalin's purges of the 1930s. As one of Stalin's most trusted allies, he was known for his brutal enforcement of political loyalty. During the Russo-Finnish War of 1939-1940, Meklis ordered the execution of officers and soldiers whom he deemed insufficiently aggressive. His interference in military affairs during World War II, particularly in the Crimea, led to significant losses for the Red Army though his close relationship with Stalin ensured he faced minimal repercussions. While Moscow wrestled with the bureaucratic complexities of organising the partisans, the units themselves remained largely inactive during the summer and fall of 1941. The most significant partisan actions came from groups that had absorbed Red Army stragglers who had found refuge in their camps. These soldiers, trained in military tactics and familiar with weaponry, shared their knowledge with the civilian partisans, greatly improving their effectiveness. These more experienced detachments initiated the first disruptions to the German supply and communication lines, delivering small but strategic blows to the enemy. Geography played a critical role in the success of these early partisan operations. The dense forests and expansive swamps of eastern Belarusia and western Russia provided ideal cover for the guerrilla fighters. The partisans could launch quick surprise attacks on German forces and then vanish into the rugged landscape, making pursuit difficult. German security forces, often unwilling to leave the safety of their bases, preferred to stay near the installations they were guarding, rather than risk chasing partisans into the wilderness. Those that did pursue the partisans frequently fell into ambushes, facing unseen enemies who knew the terrain far better than they did. As partisan operations gradually intensified, their attacks began to wear down German supply chains and communications. These early actions, though small in scale, demonstrated the potential of the partisan movement, with the backing of the Soviet state and the military experience of Red Army soldiers, the partisans were evolving into a formidable force capable of creating significant disruption behind German lines. One of the few partisan units that managed to organize effectively in the early days of the German invasion was a Belarusian detachment led by Mihai Filipovich Shmirev. Ironically, Shmirev, who became one of the first to lead a successful partisan group, had previous combat experience mainly in fighting anti-Soviet partisans during and after the Russian Civil War. Shmirev formed his unit on July 9th, starting with just 23 men, most of whom worked in a small factory he managed. Their first weapons came from Soviet soldiers who were retreating from the advancing Germans. Over time, Shmirev's group expanded as they attracted Red Army stragglers and local civilians who were motivated to join the resistance. Their first offensive action occurred on July 25th, when Shmirev and a squad of his men ambushed a group of Germans bathing in a river. The attack inflicted between 25 and 35 casualties on the enemy, while Shmirev's men suffered no losses. In August, they continued to target lightly defended convoys and other vulnerable German positions using ambush tactics to great effect. By early September, Shmirev's efforts had gained recognition from Soviet officials who reinforced his unit with 12 Red Army soldiers. Along with the reinforcements, they received crucial supplies including four heavy machine guns with 15,000 rounds of ammunition, as well as a light and heavy mortar. As the Wehrmacht advanced deeper into Soviet territory, partisan units were ordered to intensify their attacks on key infrastructure, particularly rail lines in the occupied regions. The road network in Western Russia had already been in poor condition before the war, and the movement of German 
tanks and armoured vehicles made the situation worse, churning up the few usable roads and leaving them nearly impassable for supply trucks following the front. The Soviet railway system posed an additional challenge for the Germans. The gauge of the Soviet rail tracks differed from that of Germany, and German construction battalions had to painstakingly adjust the rails to accommodate German gauge rolling stock for transporting supplies to the front. This process was slow, even with conscripted labour from occupied territories. Early attempts by partisans to sabotage these rail lines had limited success, as the Germans were able to repair the damage within a day or two. However, the deeper the Wehrmacht pushed eastward, the more strained and vulnerable their supply network became. In addition to disrupting supply lines, one of the key roles of partisan units in the early months of the war was rescuing stranded Soviet formations that had been bypassed by the advancing Germans and were now trapped behind enemy lines. Many of these soldiers were successfully guided back to Soviet-controlled territory. For example, in October, partisans rescued around 800 encircled soldiers in the Poltava region. Another group managed to save General Kuznetsov of the 3rd Army and 600 of his men, providing a crucial morale boost to the Soviet effort. In its early stages, partisan activity was scattered, but still provided Soviet propagandists with numerous stories aimed at fostering hatred toward the Germans and encouraging sacrifice for the Russian motherland. Few things resonate more with Russians than tragic or emotional tales, and the communist propagandists were adept at stirring the hearts of the people, whether they were devoted party members or covert anti-Stalinists. One such story revolved around a young girl named Zoya Kosmodemyanskaya, Born in 1923, Zoya became part of a partisan group in the fall of 1941. She quickly adapted to the harsh demands of partisan warfare, engaging in tasks such as laying mines and gathering intelligence. In November, she volunteered to infiltrate the German-occupied village of Petrushevo to scout and cause as much disruption as possible. Within a few days, Zoya was captured and endured brutal interrogations. According to a German sergeant who witnessed the events, the young girl remained silent throughout the ordeal. When the interrogation failed, the Germans paraded her through the village before executing her by hanging. Zoya's disfigured body was left hanging for over a month until the Red Army eventually reclaimed the village. One of the earliest documented incidents occurred in the forest near Smolensk in July 1941. German infantry units advancing through the region were frequently attacked by partisans. In one particular incident, a group of around 15 German soldiers, separated from their larger unit due to the chaos of the advance, were captured by Soviet partisans. According to reports from German military archives, the partisans used brutal tactics during the capture and interrogation of these soldiers. The soldiers were tied up and tortured horrifically for information about German troop movements. Reports suggest that partisans employed psychological and physical torture, including mutilation, some stuff I can't even say on here. As a way of extracting intelligence and instilling fear among other German soldiers, these captured soldiers were executed after enduring hours of brutal treatment, and their bodies were left hanging in the village square to send a message to other German troops in the area, with some of them being dismembered. This kind of execution was not uncommon in the early months of the war, as partisans sought to disrupt German operations by sowing fear and panic among the invaders. Soviet partisan leaders like Sidia Kovpak, who would later become one of the most notorious commanders, directed their forces to show no mercy to German soldiers. This is why the war against the partisans became so savage. Once word spread of fellow German soldiers being dismembered and brutally tortured, it ignited a vicious cycle of retaliation. The conflict devolved into a brutal, lawless bandit war where captured partisans were often executed on the spot without hesitation. As the violence escalated on both sides, the brutality only intensified, fueling a relentless spiral of atrocities and retribution. News of Zoya Kosmodemyanskaya's death spread rapidly throughout both occupied and un occupied Soviet territories. Her story ignited a wave of patriotism, leading to a significant increase in volunteers for the partisan movement. Although the partisan movement was struggling in its early stages, Meklis issued an order prioritizing political indoctrination for all volunteers. In many cases, NKVD teams interviewed potential partisans, rejecting those who did not display sufficient communist fervor. Even as German forces approached Moscow, Soviet political paranoia placed greater emphasis on loyalty to the party than on the urgent need to defend the motherland by any means necessary. The year 1941 was largely focused on organising the Russian partisan movement. Official Soviet accounts claim that between 2,000 and 3,500 partisan detachments were established during the first six months of the war. While no specific manpower numbers 
are provided, even the figure for detachments may be inflated due to the disorganized nature of this period. The slow-moving Soviet bureaucracy, lack of weapons, unclear directives from Moscow, and party interference resulted in limited action and partial stagnation within the movement. However, this would soon change. A pivotal moment for the Soviet partisans came with the Red Army's offensive in December 1941. Before that, much of the population in German-occupied Russia had either welcomed the Germans as liberators, as was the case in Ukraine, or continued to focus on survival, having simply exchanged one oppressive regime for another. During the summer and fall of 1941, the Wehrmacht appeared unbeatable, and Moscow's calls for resistance were largely ignored. While some recruits were drawn by appeals to defend the motherland, with little reference to the Communist Party, the overwhelming presence of German soldiers and their formidable panzer and motorized columns heading east discouraged any overt action. When the Red Army launched its counter-offensive during one of the harshest winters in a century, the situation changed dramatically. The local population in occupied territories now saw a different German soldier, cold, scared and hungry, as the once triumphant forces retreated westward, their lines shattered by Soviet advances. Even the German reinforcements moving toward the front displayed signs of uncertainty, which did not go unnoticed by the locals. Fear also played a critical role during the Winter Offensive. Early in the war, Soviet propaganda had warned of severe punishments for collaborating with the enemy, a threat that seemed hollow as the Germans advanced on all fronts. Although modern communication between towns and villages in Western Russia was almost non-existent, information spread through word of mouth, news of the massive encirclements in July and August circulated, making it difficult for Moscow to hide the crushing defeats that plagued the Red Army during the war's early months. By December, that same informal communication network began to spread news of the German retreat. The propagandist's rallying cry, the Red Army is on the way, now seemed plausible, causing many to reconsider their stance. Memories of Stalin's brutal policies, such as the starvation of the Kulaks and the purges of the 1930s, remained fresh and people knew that Stalin's revenge would be swift and merciless. Faced with the early Soviet victories in December, many felt it was time to act. A straddling the fence was no longer a safe option. German commanders in the rear were increasingly concerned about the growing partisan activity. On December 14th, Heersgruppe Mitte, Army Group Center, received a report from one of its Koroks, Commandant Rückwärtiges Armeegebiet, Commandant of an Army Rear Area, highlighting a troubling development, quote, As the Russians have become more active on the front, partisan activity has also increased, end quote. The forces under this command are now only just enough to protect the most vital installations, as well as, to some extent, the railroads and highways. However, there are no longer any troops available for anti-partisan operations. It is therefore expected that soon the partisans will join into larger groups and begin attacking our guard posts. This communique underscored the growing threat posed by Soviet partisans as the German forces were stretched thin. With their resources largely committed to the front lines, the German command was finding it increasingly difficult to suppress the partisan movement. The warning was clear, the partisans were gaining strength and mobility, and their activities could soon shift from small-scale ambushes to more coordinated attacks. This growing threat also had the potential to undermine German control over the local population, who might begin to resist German authority as partisans exerted influence through fear and sabotage. A report from another Koruk noted a significant shift in the situation in the army's rear area. During their earlier victories, the region had been almost pacified, with minimal partisan activity and the local population largely supportive of the Germans. However, as the tide turned, the people's confidence in German strength began to waver. New partisan groups infiltrated the area, supported by parachutists sent to organize the civilians fit for service, along with previously inactive partisans, escaped prisoners of war, and Soviet soldiers recently discharged from military hospitals. As partisan activity intensified, the German army implemented stricter security measures in the rear. Each field army had a Koruk responsible for securing a specific rear sector, supported by Sicherheitsdivision and security divisions. These divisions included an infantry alarm regiment of three battalions, a Landeschützen regiment of three to four battalions, and a guard battalion. Additionally, the Koruk could request assistance from police units and independent SS battalions. Local volunteers, particularly from Ukraine and the Baltic states, Ostruppen, were formed into battalion-sized units to reinforce German forces. These units, known for their ruthless tactics, contributed to the savage nature of the war behind the front lines, where prisoners were rarely taken by either side. As the partisan movement expanded, securing the rear areas became a growing drain on German and Allied manpower. 
Even small-scale partisan operations could lead to significant consequences. For instance, during the German retreat from the Soviet counter-offensive, a partisan demolition team led by A. Andrianov destroyed one of the few remaining bridges over the Sestra River. This created a severe bottleneck, enabling the Red Air Force to attack, destroying around a hundred German vehicles before alternative routes could be found. While 1941 was a period of building for the Soviet partisan movement, 1942 marked a phase of expansion and increased action. An example of this escalation occurred east of Bryansk when a German railway construction company attempted to repair damaged tracks without adequate security. After communication with the company's headquarters ceased, patrols found the entire company dead, with the partisans long gone. With no additional forces available for protection, the repair work was halted, cutting off a vital supply line for the Germans. By 1942, Moscow intensified its control over partisan operations, centralizing local units under regional commanders. In the Smolensk sector, for instance, ten detachments were combined into a larger unit, codenamed Batia, which had over 5,000 members, allowing them to engage in regular battles with German forces. As the partisan movement gained momentum, more resources were allocated to support it. Partisan units were provided with military communications equipment and dedicated radio channels were established for their use. Initially, the Red Air Force dropped weapons and supplies via parachute, but by 1942, larger partisan groups had constructed airstrips in the dense forests and marshes they operated from. These airstrips, expertly camouflaged and nearly invisible from the air, were used for nighttime supply runs, with partisans removing camouflage and lighting small fires along the runway to guide aircraft. Partisans also began receiving more advanced training. Select fighters were flown out of occupied territories to specialized schools, where they received enhanced instruction before returning to their units. Genuine collaboration with the Red Army began in earnest in 1942. The winter offensive pushed German forces back by over 100 kilometers in some areas, and partisans played a key role in harassing the retreating Wehrmacht, cutting off their withdrawal routes and guiding Soviet forces through difficult terrain to ambush the enemy. However, the rapid Soviet advance in January 1942 led to an overloaded supply system. As the winter offensive stalled against fierce German resistance, partisans helped overstretched Russian forces navigate back to friendly lines. Psychologically, the impact of the partisan movement during the first winter of the war far outweighed its actual achievements. Field Marshal Gunther von Kluge, commander of Heeres Gruppe Mitte, reported, quote, The steady increase in enemy troops behind our front and the corresponding rise of the partisan movement in the entire rear area are taking on a dangerous scale, end quote. Stressing the seriousness of this threat, he also noted the growing cooperation between the partisans and the Red Army, which was emboldening the partisans and allowing them to disrupt communications and divert German troops from the front lines. However, the real issue was the anxiety among German soldiers who were uncertain when or where the partisans would strike next. This constant fear, particularly during night movements along the few passable roads, led to depression and insomnia, severely diminishing the effectiveness of troops once they reached the front. Von Kluger's concerns were justified in one key area. From June 22, 1941 to November 6, the German army had suffered over 650,000 casualties. By early April 1942, an additional 900,000 casualties from all causes had been recorded. Despite reinforcements and returning wounded, the army was still short by approximately 600,000 men. This manpower shortage forced a reallocation of security forces, leaving many smaller bridges and crossings behind the front unprotected. The partisans swiftly took advantage of this vulnerability, destroying numerous bridges and further complicating the German supply chain. In response, the German High Command sought security reinforcements from its Axis allies and recruited more pro-German local forces to assist in anti-partisan efforts. One of the most notorious anti-partisan units was led by Bronislaw Kaminski, a Polish-born engineer and fervent anti-communist. When the Germans encountered Kaminski during the winter offensive in the heavily partisan-affected Bryansk sector, he commanded a force of roughly 1,500 men, known for their brutal tactics in suppressing partisans. Fighting under the banner of the Tsarist St. George's Cross, Bronislaw Kaminski established his own dominion in the region, and by 1942, his force had swelled to over 9,000 men. Since the Germans had been unable to make significant progress against the partisans in the area, they granted Kaminski semi-autonomous control in exchange for his relentless pursuit of partisan forces. 
Kaminsky and his men gained infamy for their extreme brutality. They raised both partisan and non-partisan villages, massacring civilians in their wake. Under his reign of terror, plunder were rampant as his forces moved across the countryside. Even German SS units operating in the region were horrified by the excesses of the Kaminsky Brigade. In 1944, Kaminsky was executed by order of SS Lieutenant General Erich von den Bach Zalewski. Despite brutal anti-partisan efforts like Kaminsky's, the partisan movement continued to grow. Working both independently and in coordination with the Red Army, partisans frequently attacked German vehicles and communication lines. Some units even managed to liberate towns held by German garrisons, often leading to the swift execution of any surviving enemy soldiers. The increasing effectiveness of the partisan movement was reflected in the winter of 1941 to 1942, when over 1,800 German vehicles were destroyed, 650 bridges demolished, and 225 trains derailed by partisan attacks on rail lines. Although the Germans had largely stabilised the front by May, remnants of Soviet forces remained cut off behind enemy lines since the Winter Offensive. One of the largest groups was located in the bryansk smolensk Vyazma Triangle, led by Major General P. A. Belov, and the remnants of his 1st Guards Cavalry Corps, which included parachute troops and survivors from the 33rd Army. Collaborating closely with partisan groups, Belov's forces struck weak points behind German lines, using the partisans' intelligence on enemy troop movements to hit vulnerable positions and retreat before the Germans could respond. By mid-May, the Germans had enough. They launched a two-pronged offensive, codenamed Hanover, to eliminate Belov's forces. On May 24th, a combined force of three panzer divisions, three infantry divisions and one security division began the operation. However, the attack was delayed by the destruction of bridges by partisans, forcing the Germans to wait for engineers to rebuild the structures in order to cross the region's swollen rivers and streams. Partisan units shadowed the German advance, providing Bailov with critical intelligence that allowed him to withdraw his forces out of danger. When the German forces converged on May 27th, they claimed to have taken about 2,000 prisoners and killed another 1,500 Soviet troops, but the results fell short of expectations. Belov still commanded approximately 17,000 men, but recognizing his situation was becoming untenable, he decided to attempt a breakout towards Soviet lines. Using partisan guides, his forces moved from one partisan controlled area to another. Although the Luftwaffe eventually spotted Belov's columns, by the time German ground forces closed in, Belov and his men had already moved into a dense forest controlled by the Lazo Partisan Regiment. The Germans refused to pursue them further, fearing the likelihood of well-prepared partisan ambushes. Upon finally reaching the front, Belov regrouped his forces and launched an attack. A fierce battle ensued, but Belov later claimed to have safely brought at least 10,000 men through the lines, although he had been flown out before the fighting began. Thanks to the partisans' efforts, a substantial number of well-trained Soviet troops had survived to fight again, while several German divisions, urgently needed at the front, had been diverted to pursue them behind enemy lines. The late spring mud season offered the partisans a crucial opportunity to reorganize. The winter had been brutal for all sides engaged in the intense combat. Strength reports sent to Moscow indicated the loss of around 20,000 partisans from all causes. Official Soviet figures estimate that by spring 1942, approximately 70,000 effective partisans were still operating. By the end of summer, their numbers had swelled to about 125,000. A significant change in the partisan organization occurred in May 1942. While Stalin had ordered the creation of a central staff to oversee partisan activities back in July 1941, control had largely remained in the hands of Meklis and NKVD chief Lavrenti Beria. However, on May 30th, P.K. Ponomarenko took over as chief of the central staff of the partisan movement, effectively wresting control from the NKVD. This shift brought the partisans into closer coordination with the military. Ponomarenko, now attached to the headquarters of the Supreme Commander, Stalin, quickly established staff personnel at various front and theatre headquarters, working directly with army commanders to integrate partisan activities within their operational sectors. Around the same time that Ponomarenko assumed his new role, Hitler launched his offensive towards Stalingrad. The German advance brought new territories under occupation, which in turn provided the Wehrmacht with fresh anti-partisan forces. As they moved across the steppes and into the Caucasus, the German army demonstrated considerable tolerance toward many of the ethnic tribes they encountered. This approach yielded a wave of volunteers from various local groups, eager to join the German forces. The Don, Kuban, Terek and Siberian Cossacks were organized into legions to assist the Germans in their fight against the Soviets and to safeguard the vulnerable German supply routes. Additionally, thousands of Armenians, Azerbaijanis, Georgians and North Caucasians joined the German forces alongside the Kalmucks, a Mongolian nomadic people who lived west of the Volga River and northwest of the Caspian Sea. 
Notably, many of these ethnic groups were Muslim, while the Kalmuks were predominantly Buddhist. The Wehrmacht went to great lengths to accommodate their religious practices, providing each group with its own religious leaders or chaplains. These ethnic groups had suffered under Stalin's oppressive rule and the communist system, which fueled their fierce resistance against Soviet partisans emerging in the newly occupied territories. As the war neared its end, many of these groups retreated westward with the German forces. Tragically, after the war, most were handed over to the Soviets by American and British forces, where they faced execution or were sent to the gulags where many perished. The sheer length of the German communication and supply lines stretching across the vast Eastern Front made them a prime target for Soviet partisans. Once again, partisan forces were ordered to focus on disrupting these critical links. Throughout the summer and fall of 1942, demolition squads conducted numerous attacks on fuel and supply depots as well as the German railway network deep behind the front lines. During this period, hundreds of railway and highway bridges were destroyed, and more than 300 trains were derailed between June and November. In response, the Germans launched several anti-partisan operations. One notable effort was Operation Vogelsang, Birdsong, which took place north of Bryansk. In this operation, German armoured and infantry units swept across a 19,000 square kilometre area in a determined attempt to locate and eliminate the elusive partisans. However, despite such large-scale operations, the partisans continued to cause significant disruption to German logistics, underscoring the growing impact of their efforts in the war. The dense network of forest trails, bordered by nearly impenetrable brush, provided Soviet partisans with ample opportunities to ambush German forces at every turn. Operation Vogelsang, which lasted about a month, resulted in the capture of around 500 suspected partisans and the killing of another 1,200, modest numbers given the scale of the operation. Photos from the time depict the exhaustion and strain on German troops involved in these actions. While German anti-partisan operations inflicted casualties on the guerrillas, they failed to halt partisan activity. The German railway system remained a primary target. Between May and November 1942, partisans derailed numerous trains in the Leningrad sector. In the Smolensk sector alone, over 300 trains were derailed from June to October, with an additional 226 in the Bryansk region. In Belarusia, over 800 trains were derailed between June and November. Partisans also destroyed hundreds of railway bridges in the latter half of 1942, further stretching German resources. The Wehrmacht, already thinly spread on the main front, had to divert more divisions from combat duties to address the partisan threat. By the end of 1942, 10% of the German field divisions on the Eastern Front were reassigned to anti-partisan roles. As 1942 drew to a close, word of the looming disaster at Stalingrad spread across the occupied territories, affecting both Germans and Russians. German morale, particularly in supposedly secure areas, began to falter. The news of Stalingrad, combined with the growing partisan activity along the supply routes, had a demoralizing effect on German garrison troops responsible for guarding bridges and railways. Partisan actions also severely impacted the flow of food supplies from the occupied areas to the German forces. As partisan units grew bolder, they began entering villages to seize resources and destroy what they couldn't take. Entire village populations were coerced into abandoning their homes and fleeing to the forests, depriving the Germans of the food and labour needed to sustain their military presence. Some villagers left out of patriotism, while others were forced at gunpoint. Assassinations of collaborators further heightened tensions between the occupation forces and the local population. The increasing strain on German forces led Koruks, rear area commanders, to plead with Berlin for more troops, but with the impending defeat at Stalingrad, those requests went unanswered. In desperation, more Ostropen battalions were raised, but the questionable quality of these troops made them an unreliable deterrent against the growing partisan threat. In December 1942, in response to the worsening situation, the German High Command appointed SS Lieutenant General Erik von dem Bakselevsky as Chief of Anti-Partisan Forces. A fervent National Socialist, von dem Bach had been involved in Heinrich Himmler's SS and was notorious for his role in the 1934 Night of the Long Knives, during which he ordered the assassination of a rival SS officer. During the invasion of the Soviet Union, he oversaw Einsatzgruppen murder squads, responsible for political killings behind the front lines. His participation in these atrocities led to a nervous breakdown, but after receiving treatment, he returned to duty and took on his new role. 
With von den Bach's appointment, the partisan war entered a new and more brutal phase. Partisan leaders, aware of his reputation for ruthlessness, prepared to face an even more aggressive enemy. This was especially true for the Jewish partisan units, who often faced hostility from both the Germans and the local Russian population. There was a notable distinction between Jewish and non-Jewish partisan groups. Non-Jewish partisans, motivated by patriotism or communist ideology, could generally rely on the local population for supplies. Most fought knowing that their families, despite the hardships, would likely survive the war and be reunited once the Soviet territories were liberated by the Red Army. For Jewish partisans, the situation was far more dire. Those who escaped to the forest knew that they would likely never see their families again, as many had witnessed or learned of the mass slaughter of Jews by the Einsatzgruppen. Jewish partisans fought not only for their country, but for revenge. They received little support from the local peasant population, which often harboured more animosity toward Jews than toward the Germans. Despite this, Jewish partisan groups gained respect from other units for their daring raids. In Belarusia, a unit led by the Bielski brothers grew to around 1,200 fighters, while another, commanded by Shalom Zernin, had about 800 Jewish fighters. Both Jewish and non-Jewish partisan groups continued to grow in strength throughout the first half of 1943. The spring mud season provided a temporary break from combat, allowing the partisans to train new recruits and gather supplies. In response to the increasing threat posed by the partisans, von den Bach ordered the creation of Jagd Commando, Hunter Commando units in early 1943. These independent units, typically of company size, were designed to confront the partisans in their own environment. The Jagdkommando operated deep in the forests and swamps, staying for extended periods and moving mostly by night. They tracked well-worn paths used by partisans, setting up ambushes to inflict severe casualties on smaller groups. While these ambushes sometimes caused significant losses to the partisans, they did not prevent the continued recruitment of Soviet locals, who quickly replaced the fallen fighters. Despite these countermeasures, the partisans remained a persistent and growing threat to German control in the occupied territories, significantly weakening their supply lines and morale as the war continued to turn against the Axis powers. In the spring of 1943, Adolf Hitler was preparing for a major battle aimed at destroying Soviet forces positioned in a massive bulge in the Kursk sector. To support the offensive, large numbers of troops and equipment were transferred to the area in anticipation of the upcoming fight. However, the Soviets were well informed about Hitler's intentions. Their intelligence network had uncovered many details of the German plan, and partisan sources provided the Red Army with up-to-date information on enemy troop movements and dispositions. Hitler continued to delay the offensive, codenamed Citadel, in order to amass even more divisions for the attack. German commanders grew increasingly anxious about the repeated postponements, especially regarding the potential impact of partisan activity on their rear supply lines once the offensive began. With each delay, the partisans had more time to disrupt crucial rail lines supplying the German forces. In response, the German army made the decision to temporarily divert some of the divisions that had been earmarked for the offensive to secure the railroads and eliminate as many partisan groups as possible in the lead-up to the attack, which was finally scheduled for July 5th. Throughout May and June, battle-hardened German infantry and panzer units launched several operations in the Bryansk sector to suppress the partisans. Operations such as Osterei, Freischutz, Tannhauser and Zigeunerbaren inflicted significant casualties on the partisan forces. However, despite these losses, the partisans managed to maintain their cohesion. Most surviving units retreated into the forests and marshes, where they regrouped and absorbed new recruits in preparation for the forthcoming battle. Even under the intense pressure of German operations, the partisans remained a persistent threat, continuing to sabotage supply lines and hinder the flow of resources to the front as the pivotal Battle of Kursk loomed. In preparation for the anticipated German offensive, Stavka, Soviet High Command, issued orders to the central headquarters for the partisan movement to carry out large-scale operations targeting the enemy's rail network. The Red Army planned to launch a counteroffensive after the German attack had exhausted itself and disrupting the German supply lines was seen as critical to the success of this operation. Operation Citadel initially showed some success for the Germans, but on July 13th, Hitler, anxious about the Allied invasion of Sicily, decided to halt the offensive. He ordered key SS Panzer divisions to disengage and redeploy to the Mediterranean front. Both sides had sustained heavy casualties during the nine-day battle, but the Soviets had a significant reserve ready to launch their counter-attack once the opportunity arose. 
On July 17th, the Russian counter-offensive began, with the Soviet southwest and south fronts attacking the flank of Hera's Gruppe Sud. Heavy rains provided a brief respite for Hera's Gruppe Mitte, preventing Soviet forces from advancing due to the muddy conditions. The commander of Hera's Gruppe Mitte, Colonel General Walter Model, informed Hitler that his forces would need to retreat to shorten their lines. For once, Hitler agreed, and on August 1st, the divisions of Hera's Gruppe Mitte began their withdrawal to the west. The Partzan operation, codenamed Rail War, was pivotal to the Soviet counter-offensive. Throughout June and July, while the Battle of Kursk raged, ammunition, weapons, explosives and demolition experts were flown into Partzan bases to prepare for the operation. In Belarusia alone, 123 Partzan units were assigned to sabotage railways. Each unit was divided into demolition teams, with specific sections of track designated for destruction. Across the northern and central sectors of the front, between 200,000 and 300,000 sections of railway were marked as targets. Preliminary attacks began in late July as the Soviet counter-offensive gained momentum. Partisan units successfully blocked a major rail line south of Bryansk for two days, and by the end of the month, the Germans reported over 1,100 separate attacks on railways in the central sector. As Heer's Gruppe Mitte began its withdrawal on August 1st, the partisan units involved in rail war were placed on high alert. They moved to their designated positions, waiting for the signal to strike. The order came on August 3rd, coinciding with the German retreat. During the nights of August 3rd and 4th, Heer's Gruppe Mitte reported more than 4,100 instances of railway sabotage. Similar attacks occurred across other sectors of the front. In total, Heer's Gruppe Nord, Mitte and Sud experienced the destruction of 262 kilometers of track. The attacks derailed supply trains bound for the front, severely disrupting German logistics and creating chaos for their supply lines. In the Pinz district of Belarusia, the Germans labored from early August until September 19th to repair sections of railway track destroyed by the Yemeni Lenina, in the name of Lenin, partisan brigade. However, after only one day of restored service, the brigade struck again, disabling the tracks. It wasn't until mid-October that the line finally became operational once more. These types of attacks were widespread across the front. In southern Russia's Odessa sector, the second partisan brigade, led by S. Kaplan, severed the Sarani Luminets rail line, rendering it unusable from August 15th to October 19th. Meanwhile, the 3rd Partisan Brigade, operating behind Hera's Gruppe Nord's lines, claimed to have destroyed 10,000 sections of track in August alone. Despite the extensive damage inflicted on German infrastructure, Soviet officials in Moscow were somewhat dissatisfied with the scale of the August Partisan efforts. Communist leaders had called for far more attacks than what was actually executed, showing little understanding of the logistical difficulties that the Partisan units faced. Nevertheless, the Partisans had done all they could to support the broader Soviet military efforts efforts. The Partisan operation had the added benefit of attracting thousands of new recruits. According to Soviet estimates, which should be approached with caution, the number of Partisan fighters increased by 250% compared to the end of 1942. Even if this figure is somewhat inflated, there's no doubt that Partisan units saw a significant surge in volunteers during the latter half of 1943. With their increased numbers, the partisan forces continued to stretch German manpower thin. In the Neville sector of Hera's Gruppe Nord, partisans controlled or influenced a 3,200 square kilometre region of swamps and forests. Working alongside local party members, they re-established collective farming in the area and even set up a rudimentary postal system to communicate with officials in unoccupied regions of Russia. In Crimea, partisans were equally effective, keeping both German and Romanian occupation forces on high alert. A force of up to 8,000 fighters operated in the Yaila Mountains, where they regularly disrupted supply lines and attacked German garrisons. Their activity became so problematic that the Romanian Mountain Corps was ordered to eliminate them in late December 1943. During a week-long operation, the Romanians claimed to have killed more than 1,000 partisans and captured over 2,500, while suffering 232 casualties themselves. Despite these losses, the surviving partisans regrouped, forming new units to continue their attacks on German and Romanian forces. By early 1944, the Soviets launched two major offensives, one against Hera's Gruppe Sud and another against Hera's Gruppe Nord. In the south, the Red Army broke through German lines from Kirovograd to Korosten, forcing the Wehrmacht to retreat over 150 kilometers in some areas. In the southern part of the Pripyat marshes, partisan groups destroyed the few rail lines that existed, causing a complete breakdown of the German supply system. 
As the Soviets advanced, partisans moved westward to establish new bases from which to strike behind enemy lines. More volunteers joined their ranks and German reports estimated that four partisan units totaling nearly 9,000 fighters were operating behind the 4th Panzer Army, which was tasked with defending the area south of the marshes. In the south, the Soviet advance steadily pushed the Germans back. By mid-April, the Red Army had penetrated Romania and was approaching the borders of Poland and Hungary. Once again, partisans played a crucial role, derailing supply trains and destroying key bridges that caused significant delays for German reinforcements and supplies trying to reach the front. In the north, the Soviets launched an offensive to lift the siege of Leningrad and crush the overstretched divisions of Hera's Group of Nord. The attack was desperately trying to hold the Lake Ilmen sector was blown up in more than 300 places. As the Red Army pushed forward, partisan operations further west delayed reinforcements from reaching the front, severely hampering German efforts to stabilize their lines. As the northern and southern Soviet offensives pushed forward, they eventually slowed due to the spring rains, which transformed the battlefield into a vast quagmire. Both sides had sustained heavy casualties, and the surviving troops were exhausted. Although the front lines became relatively stagnant, Soviet partisan units continued to harass the Germans, albeit less intensely than in previous months. The Soviet advances had forced Hera's Group of Nord and Hera's Group of Sud to retreat hundreds of kilometers, leaving Hera's Group of Mitte in a vulnerable, overextended position in the center of the Eastern Front. In Moscow, Soviet planners worked tirelessly to organize a new offensive, codenamed Operation Bagration, which was aimed at delivering a decisive blow to the German forces. Operation Bagration targeted Hera's Gruppe Mitte with the combined forces of the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Belarusian fronts. Soviet sources estimated that around 150,000 partisans, organized into 150 brigades and 49 detachments, were operating behind German lines in Belarusia. Although Bagration was scheduled to begin on June 22nd, the partisans began their operations earlier. On the night of June 19th, partisans in Belarusia detonated over 9,500 explosives along German rail lines, knocking out key routes from Mogilev to Vitebsk and Minsk to Orsha for several critical days. When the Soviet offensive commenced on June 22nd, German forces were unable to move essential supplies and reinforcements to the front lines, leaving many German units in dire straits. As the Red Army advanced, partisan units further supported the Soviet offensive by preparing river and stream crossing points, allowing Russian tank and infantry divisions to press forward. Partisans also seized and held key bridgeheads, cutting off German retreat routes and disrupting their communications. By the time Operation Bagration ended in late August, the Germans had been pushed back nearly 600 kilometers in some areas. The Soviet Union had largely been liberated and Central Europe faced the unstoppable advance of the Soviet forces. With the major Soviet territories freed, many partisan groups were disbanded, some were integrated into the regular Red Army, while others were sent into German-occupied Poland and Czechoslovakia to continue their operations. These relocated partisan units had a dual mission, to disrupt German supply lines and to establish contact with communist partisan groups still operating in the occupied territories. These Soviet partisans helped form the core of communist movements that would later ensure Eastern Europe's alignment with the Soviet Union after the war. These experienced, well-armed groups played a key role in suppressing any democratic movements that arose in the post-war period. The effectiveness of the Soviet partisan movement has been the subject of debate among historians for decades. Some argue that the partisans were a critical factor in the Soviet victory, while others claim that they were little more than a nuisance to the Germans. A 1956 US Army handbook suggested that the Soviet partisan movement had a certain measure of success, perhaps as much as a resistance movement can have when opposed by a first-class military power. Early post-war German accounts often downplayed the significance of the partisans during the conflict. Nevertheless, it is clear that Soviet partisans played a crucial role in several major battles in 1943 and 1944. Their presence bolstered the morale of Soviet civilians and negatively impacted the morale of German soldiers. Additionally, the very existence of the partisans forced the Germans to divert essential troops away from the front lines to secure their rear areas, further straining their already stretched resources. By 1945, even though the Germans had been pushed out of Soviet territory, they were still facing intense partisan resistance across Eastern and Central Europe. The types of partisans they encountered varied, but these groups were often highly organized, determined, and emboldened by the crumbling state of the German war effort.
In Eastern Europe, Soviet-backed partisans continued to operate, particularly in areas like Poland and Czechoslovakia, where the Armia Ludowa, People's Army, and other communist-aligned groups waged a relentless guerrilla war. These partisans were not only fighting to expel the Germans, but also aimed to secure communist control of the region in anticipation of Soviet dominance post-war. In Poland, another significant partisan group was the Armia Krajowa, Home Army, which was loyal to the Polish government in exile. Although the Home Army had fought both Soviet and German forces at various points, by 1945 they focused primarily on the Germans, while also preparing for the possibility of future conflict with Soviet forces. Meanwhile, in Yugoslavia, the partisan movement led by Josip Broz Tito had grown into a formidable force, capable of liberating significant territories without direct Soviet aid. Tito's partisans were among the most successful in Europe, using guerrilla tactics to harass retreating German forces, while also securing control over much of Yugoslavia. Additionally, in Greece and other Balkan regions, communist partisans similarly targeted German forces, aiming to destabilize occupation regimes and reclaim their territories. These groups were often supported by local populations who were eager to see an end to the occupation. In Western Europe, though resistance movements like the Marquis in France and the Belgian resistance were somewhat less active by 1945 due to the Allied advances, partisans still disrupted German supply lines and communications as the Wehrmacht retreated. Thus, even as the Germans were driven out of the Soviet Union, they faced growing resistance across much of occupied Europe, making their situation even more precarious as the war neared its end. And with that, we wrap up today's video. I'm incredibly grateful to have you here until the end. Your support truly means the world to me. A huge shout out to my amazing patrons. If you'd like to support the channel or get access to some exclusive content, the links to my Patreon and Instagram are down below. I hope you learned something new, and as always, I'll see you in the next adventure. Take care and goodbye for now.